So my name is Bruno Armand. I'm actually the co-founder of Via Romana. We are a cycling experimentation agency based in Lyon, in France. And I will start my presentation, first of all, by uh, taking a step back. Uh, it's important to understand our history to um, get a better grip of what happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, I just wanted to show you a picture of the city of Grenoble in the French Alps in 1955. And that's probably a picture that you've all seen or probably uh, um, checked in, in the last couple of, of years. It's really to show you the impact that the bike had uh, back in the days um, in France. Um, we're talking a model share of approximately 20 to 30 percent back in the uh, in the 50s and in the 60s, as you can see here from this uh, from these graphics. Um, it has been slowly going down because of several um, um, several causes that I'm going to um, detail real quick. The first one is, of course, the inception of the car and the uh, innovation that it um, represented back in the days, but also urban sprawl that has been allowed by this technology, um, causing a, a relative lack of uh, cycling infrastructure for France. And this is just a quick map of showing you in red the cycling infrastructure that you can see in our country. This has nothing to see with what you can um, see in detail in this particular presentation on the Eastern Europe side, precisely. And, and that's a shame uh, when you consider that um, more than 60% of all daily commutes done by French people is less than five kilometers. So we're talking approximately 30 minutes maximum biking uh, commutes. Um, and of course, two thirds up to 75% um, of all commutes are being done by car. Um, that was back in 2015. So it appears that France, like in the, in the Disney fairy tale, France is a bit of a sleeping beauty when it comes to uh, cycling usage. Um, and I'm going to show you that this has been um, changing in, in the last couple of weeks. Um, why um, are we um, a sleeping beauty? First of all, because we have a very prominent car industry. We have two national manufacturers, Peugeot and Renault, who represent millions of jobs. Um, so it's difficult to, get, uh, to go against such a lobby power. The second thing is that 85% uh, of people biking, of French people biking, are usually doing it on weekends and for leisure. So a bike, um, commute by bike, is not really in our, um, in our blood. Uh, but th that's maybe about to change. The last thing is, um, that's um, an, an, uh, an inquiry uh, in 2017 that was made to ask people what are they looking for to develop more biking strategies. And they were saying that the network, the infrastructure, is really for 80% of, the, of them really, really important. So safety of comfort uh, out of a total sample of 113,000 responses that was done by the French cycling um, association in 2017 safety and comfort is really important when it comes to cycling so why has sleeping beauty opened her eyes lately well first of all a government plan back in 2018 was looking at creating more infrastructure the idea was to create have a model share for bike that would go from two percent up to nine percent in 2024 so the government voted in 2018 a 350 million euro investment program uh, for municipalities willing to roll out infrastructure, cycling infrastructure. And this will represent approximately 50 million euros per year until 2024. That's the first 150 um, cities that were um, candidated and were retained in the first round of this call. Why do we see more interest regarding cycling infrastructure or cycling in general in France? Well, we have municipal election this year, and that's the first time we've seen, and I will let Stein talk about this later on, but that's the first time we've seen municipal candidates talking about the bike plans during an election preparation. And that's very new for us. We've never seen that in France lately. Uh, this is an example of Paris, but we have the same in, in other cities too. The turning point for us in the last couple of weeks was, of course, the COVID-19. And I would say particularly uh, this date of April 13, 2020. 
This was the date when our president mentioned that the confinement will start May 11th and that we will need to find alternative ways to move around the country or to move around in our daily life. So the Ministry of the Transport and Ecology mandated Pierre Cern, um, um, who is a um, high-ranked uh, politician, to uh, find strategies to deploy um, biking at another level um, in, the, in the country. So he was in charge of being in contact with different cities and see what was the, you know, the different challenges they would meet. From this point on, you see numerous um, Twitter coverage, but also press coverage, mention of temporary bike lane um, across the world. So we had the example of, I think it was uh, Germany here, also Bogota. Um, these are all the examples you already know about, but this was new for us and it needed some um, coverage. So that was the first um, wave, so to speak. Uh, the second wave was actually to see a mayor, uh, that's the mayor of Montpellier, uh, a city of more than 100,000 inhabitants in the south of France. That's the mayor of Montpellier spray painting himself in temporary bike lane uh, end of April. I think it was the 30th of April, 2020. It's very important to know that this mayor a year before was actually against some cycling infrastructure that the local association was asking for. A very powerful image to see the first mayor spray painting his own cycling lane. This has been pushed by the local association called Velocité in Montpellier. That's an example that you see in the city of Bordeaux of temporary lanes. Most cities were going for very easy to go, easy to use um, spray, um, because it would take too much fuss to uh, have a, a more sophisticated approach in such a small amount of time. The idea was how to find alternative way to car and public transportation for people. This is another example in the city of Rennes. They added a couple of plastic bollards here, but again, the idea was to go quick and easy. Some of them were agreemented with some um, information signs. This is another example in the city of Saint-Étienne in the south of France, where they had put um, specific barriers as well. Um, to increase safety and comfort of cyclists. I will go quick on this. This is Stein's part. Uh, Paris, of course, has been prominent in offering new cycling conditions. Uh, the city of Lyon, where I lived, has been promised um, 82, that's not 77, 82 to 85 uh, temporary lanes spread, uh, spread out in several uh, waves. So a first wave of 30 kilometers across the city, then another wave in July in thir of 30 more can in September, 25 kilometers added. Um, that's something that's very prominent for, for the city. We have never seen that um, uh, in, in other conditions. You have local association of Pro most prominent French association for, for bike who has been putting this campaign together saying bike is my barrier uh, reflex uh, in order to push bike acceptation during and after COVID crisis. The coverage has been up to a, a main newspaper in France. This is a very uh, well-known newspaper in France for, for bike to be in such a ray of light it's, it's really unusual in France. And uh, I think this, this shows everything. Uh, a front page of a national newspaper doesn't happen all the time. The lesson learned from this first um, experience during COVID is that um, we people needed the, uh, to have bikes in order to use it as a commuting uh, mean of transport. Um, there was a lot of, um, how can I say that? There was a lot of lateness when it comes to repairing your own bike. So the government needed to act on that front. Um, also, it's not because you create infrastructure that people will be automatically at ease when they are starting to cycle again. So mentoring was also a big point. Uh, the last point being, how do you make sure that COVID is not just a light sparkle in people's reflexes and that they're going to embrace change fully? That's why the government came with another response, which is the coup de pouce vélo. The idea was to make sure that your bike would be repaired up to a maximum of 50 euros um, through a local um, help of the national government. So you would go on the internet 
and um, register your, your own address to make sure that you will have a 50 um, euro voucher to use at your local repair shop. Um, this will also be used to finance um, an hour and a half, up to two hours of mentoring lessons with someone who would take you to, your, um, to, a, uh, to a course or who would take you to your office uh, for free. Last but not least, cities had to, uh, could be financed up to 60% for a local parking, a temporary parking installation. So that was really a, an interesting help uh, by the government. This was announced in April uh, 29th, 2020, for first batch of 20 million euro grants. Less than a month after that, the minister that you saw before, Elizabeth Born, Minister of Transportation and Ecology, uh, tripled that amount to make it 60 million euros because it was so popular. France also announced an academy of cycling jobs um, in order to train uh, several hundreds of new repair uh, person per year because we have a big lack in, in this particular segment. And we have also announced two months in advance a mobility plan for work commute that will uh, offer to be reimbursed up to 400 euros per year if you go to work by bike. So this was supposed to happen two months from now, but it was uh, released beginning of June. The result for France um, after this COVID is actually a almost 30% average uh, back use increase across the country between May 1st and May 31st, as compared to last year. Uh, we have recorded more than a thousand kilometers of planned temporary bike lane. Some of them have been undergoing, uh, you know, some deception, but I will show you that in a minute. Uh, and we have, to my knowledge, more than 100,000 bikes already repaired, uh, but that number is evolving very quickly, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is a conservative number. The question is, are we really living a, a 1970s moment um, as compared to what happened in, in Holland? Um, you might see uh, all these interesting numbers and believe, okay, France is on the rise, it's going to happen, we're good to go. It's not a, that easy and, and change is, is, is not, um, when, when it's happening at such a, a large scale. Um, so this is my third part, why we should remain cautious about all this. Um, first of all, we already see bad habits emerging again uh, in the country. This is an example of the city of Lyon, but um, has been happening in many cities. You have people who don't, auto, auto drivers who are having a hard time understanding the signage or who are just ignoring um, the fact that they are there. So you see people not necessarily um, behaving correctly. Second thing, uh, I will explain this comic real quickly. Uh, it says 15 billion for car, 10 billion for car, uh, for, for plane, 10 billion for car, and only 50 euro for my bike. This is to show you that the French government is massively upholding the car and the aero industry. And there are still some critics about the amount of help that was offered to the cycling industry um, for, for uh, mobility alternatives. Another um, remark that was made is that there was a lot of focus on cycling, maybe too much for some people. Um, people. People were asking much more walking alternative as well on top of cycling. Um, and this has led some municipalities maybe to um, overlook the, the, the potential for walking as well, in, in particularly in dense area. So you see more and more um, municipalities looking to implement for summer uh, terraces and places to, to, to rest in the streets as compared to only a, a go-through area for bike and, and mopeds. This is, for example, in the city of Nantes. Uh, they have been um, um, enlarging municipal at many terraces uh, in the center and offering for almost free the ability to bar owners to extend the actual terrace and close some streets to cars. Change is never linear, uh, as Marco would say. Um, as you can see, there was a couple of projects that were canceled, temporary bike lane that were canceled in France. Um, not only in, in big cities, Marseille, Saint-Étienne, Aix-en-Provence, but also in smaller ones where you would believe change would be easier to happen. Um, this is, for example, a protest that happened in the city of Nice, alongside a very busy area um, with a very brand new bike lane. And you had a... Um, 
people from the area who uh, strongly opposed this um, lane, um, which makes it um, you know, difficult to envision change in a permanent basis. On the other hand, local association and institutions have been very dynamic and useful to uphold change. Um, for example, you have several regions, also several cities, who can finance up to uh, 600 euros the purchase of a new electric assist bike. And we're talking foldable bike, cargo bike, any type of electric bike. So this is something that's really interesting, specifically when you have uh, uh, the prices that are going uh, much lower these days. I will leave that to Stein, but you have a very uh, prominent association in the Paris region pushing temporary lanes um, through communicating on their websites, uh, their localization, for example. And this is an also an example from a, a prominent association in the city of Lyon, um, offering travel time maps for any point of the city um, scattered around the area. So this is a pretty big area. We're talking uh, a metropolis of a total 2 million people and, and 60 borough uh, and 60 cities. Um, but this is interesting for someone who wants to um, be able to take bike for any type of trips. Last but not least, uh, Serema uh, is a, a national um, institution, has been uh, very helpful in providing webinars, tools. Uh, this is, for example, a temporary cycling um, lane tool uh, guide. This is a temporary walking areas guide. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of documents, a lot of uh, data that is being offered for free to municipalities willing to embrace change. My conclusion would be, um, is it just a shift of paradigm? Is it a shift of paradigm or just a light sparkle? I think time will tell. I think what we see is that there is a, um, room for change. There is interest for change. Um, the, um, many uh, local association has been pushing a lot of change to happen for many years and they see something big happening. So let's hope that uh, um, you know, by the end of next year we'll have interesting numbers to show. Um, I can tell for the city of Lyon, traffic of bike is gone plus um, 50% since the end of uh, the confinement. So that's great. And we're looking to double that number by the beginning of next year. So uh, imagine doubling the numbers you had beginning of 2020 in 2021. Um, and this is, again, a conservative hypothesis. Uh, another thing is that small city needs to be assisted through time. Um, we see a, a difference between big cities who have the mean of change and smaller cities who might be a little bit more reluctant because they don't have the density, because of a lack of political uh, will or lack of resources. Um, we really believe there should be a focus on small cities willing to change as well. Last but not least, uh, it's about in, um, involving citizens um, um, in the making change happen in their own city, particularly pushing on walking and, and, and street quality of life, and not only about mobility through cycle. Um, cycling is a Trojan horse for change to happen in the city. So here we are with our sleeping beauty. Um, let's hope that she doesn't go back to sleep anymore. Um, it has been mostly pushed through national world legislation and strict reclamation. Um, France is a very centralized country. If the government starts something, um, it's up to the local authorities to do their part. So far, it has been working well. Let's see what this holds for the future. Thank you very much. My name is Stijn van Ooster. I'm a Dutch-French national. I lived half of my life in the Netherlands and the other half in France. And I'm the founder of a small bike association in a city south from Paris, Fontenelle Rose, 24,000 inhabitants. And I am the spokesperson of the new, let's say, the Paris Bike Federation, which is, uh, which is a huge region, 12 million people. And we have over 38 uh, member associations at this point. And it's a recent uh, federation that actually is the key to the success we're currently living. I'll give you some, uh, I'll do it in three parts as well. Uh, and then I would like to react at the end to the very interesting presentation of, of Bruno, if possible. Um, just to give you a feel of what's happening concretely in the streets, then I'll show you some maps, and then I'll try to tell you, if we have time, the human story behind it, because this is not about infrastructure only, this is about people. 
this is where it started. This is right next to Paris in Montreuil and saint mandé These were the first corona lanes that were created. Let's see if I up. These are, the, the two, I'm not going to talk about Lyon. I just uh, chose these because they're bad examples in my uh, opinion, because they're central bike lanes. Please never uh, choose central bike lanes because people, they feel uncomfortable. We can talk about that later, maybe. This is what we're fighting against in Paris and in every uh, city where there's no bike infrastructure. Look at this bicycle here, right in the middle. It's actually a video that I could show you. This is what many intersections currently look like in France. It's unbelievable. Um, of course, in this situation, no person who never biked before will hop on a bike. So, but this is about to change. Look at the next picture. This is the very first Dutch, kind of Dutch bicycle intersection in Corona style in France. And it's in noisy le sec which is a city uh, east from Paris. And it's also a video that I could show you. You can see how the bike is protected from the cars. And this is absolutely uh, revolutionary. If we would do this, everybody would be able to bike there. This is another example, also in the eastern suburbs of, of Paris. I mean, this could never have uh, happened before because it would have taken too much time. This is also the super revolutionary. This was done last week. It's an impossible place for the, for the bicycle to go. It's a roundabout. It's the Pompadour roundabout. It's a completely, uh, it's a highway look kind of setting. But uh, the, the, the uh, region, um, actually the, the, the département, which is a kind of a province, decided in its cooperation with us to, to make it accessible to bikes. So here you see everything you need. You see the separation between cars and bikes. You see the, 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 the um, how do you call it, the buffer zone that uh, cars have to turn around so that they really see the bike very well. You see a bus platform that is extended so that the bus doesn't have to cut the bicycle lane, but uh, so that the, that the, that the uh, bus platform can go to the bus so that the bikes can continue their, uh, their, uh, their path. You see a bicycle stop signs. Here it is formally clear that the bicycle has a priority, which is not at all uh, usual in, in, in France. Um, this is really progress. It looks a bit messy, but this is the difference between uh, being able to bike or not. This is an, uh, another uh, picture I just took actually a couple of days ago on a brand new street. And I, I show you this picture uh, to see how revolutionary it is. This is what was just created by the same provinces with whom we are trying to, to set up Corona uh, infrastructure. This is a um, failure because you just see some, what we call bande de cyclable. It's just the little strips, bicycle strips with zero protection. Of course, no child will ever use this. And it was just created. But it's because this had to go through a very long negotiation process and then well, it popped up. Nowadays, in the Corona uh, era, we immediately have everybody around the table so we avoid these kinds of mistakes because everybody is there to say, stop, please don't do that. This is, emblematic. This is very symbolic. This is a national highway, number 13, that connects the biggest um, uh, business district of the Paris region, La Défense, to Paris. And for many years, it was absolutely impossible to ever imagine a bicycle lane on it. And then just in 24 hours, uh, we agreed with the state, because it's, it, it is um, governed directly by the state, to, uh, to make it cyclable. And here you go, look at this. There's a little boy bicycling on a national highway. This would have been absolutely unimaginable uh, some, some time ago. This is another example in Paris. It's also revolutionary. Why? Just because of these five little poles. You know, that's, that, that makes it a little bit Dutch intersection-like. Before, there was no protection. The intersections were just some no man's uh, land where, where cars just throw themselves in and the bicycles, they just have to find their way out. Here, the bicycle can quietly stop and is protected from the cars that are also turning right. This is another innovation that Paris uh, put in place. It's the um, delivery zones that are in between the bicycle lane and the, um, the motorized flow. So you see this, uh, this little bus Cannot, can no longer access the other, uh, I can show it here. It doesn't have to access this zone because it was just uh, uh, closed. 
and it can now park here. So this is a really nice innovation. And this is another innovation. This is the, the extended uh, bus platforms so that the bicycle can continue its path and the bus can quietly stop and the cars can still continue their, their, um, their, uh, their itinerary. Now I'll show you six maps to show you the story of what happened in Paris. This is current, the current state of affairs of the uh, Paris region bicycle network. And it's a, so to speak bicycle network because it's not a network, it's confetti. It's little pieces that, that, that are there that are just thrown on the region. And um, the bicycle associations, uh, it started actually in my, my town here. Um, I, I invited some bicycle um, associations to get around the table to see what we could do together. I work for the Dutch government, uh, so in diplomacy, so I'm, I'm used to bringing um, countries around the table to, to create coalitions. And I thought, hey, let's do the same thing with the bicycle scene. And we sit together and we realized something that we never realized by ourselves, namely that in our region, we cannot go from one city to another on a bike. We were always fighting for little um, bicycle strips within our city, but we forgot the big picture, which is the region that we should make bicyclable. So we said, hey, let's, sit, let's, let's take a step back and let's see where we would put the bicycle lanes if we want to make our whole region bicyclable. This is what it looks like on a U-map, on an open street map. We got nine bicycle lanes, um, seven of which are in, in red, and two are blue because they go along the rivers, Seine and Marne. So this is the plan that we drafted together to make our region bicyclable. And then we thought, well, this doesn't look very sexy, so let's make it look nice. And here you go. This is what we, we, we drafted with some professional help because we are a super big network. So we have lawyers, designers, we have everything we need. And here you can see really what this transportation network looks like. And now comes the most important part of my explanations on this, uh, this network. The reason why this worked so well and why the politicians accepted it is because it is a copy of the railway network of the region. It's exactly the same thing. It has the same, line, same number of lines. The lines have the same color. The name is the same because the uh, metro uh, network is called RER. We also call it the RER, our bicycle network, but we call it the RERV from Velo, that means bike. And uh, we just, the little difference is that we have the Seine and the Marne uh, line, but basically people who look at it, they immediately know that this is a network and not just some bicycle, some bicycle path for leisure. And this is the, the map that Bruno just showed us um, because what I showed you here, it's, it's a concept for now. Politicians said, hey, we want to finance it, uh, but uh, it's going to take some time. Well, now we need to start immediately with because of the Corona crisis. And so um, we send letters to the, all the departments around Paris, uh, 12 million inhabitants, and they agreed to create some Corona uh, bicycle lanes. And, but for us, it was important so that the people could see where they run, where they are. And so on this map, you can see the, in gray the, the, the plans. Well, it's already old now, but on, if you go to the website of the Collectif Vélo de France, this bicycle association, you can find this in real time. So in gray, you see the plans, and in red, you see the ones that are created. And in, in, in orange too, the, the red ones are actually already there, and the orange ones are the Corona cycle lanes that, that are created. So this really helps people to see that actually, they never realized that they lived so close to their job on a bicycle distance. This is just a visual tool that people need to get around. And now I'll go to my uh, last part, uh, which is the human story uh, behind it. Um, it started in, on 1 May 2018 in, in, in my city. As I said, I said, well, let's invite people. Let's, let's just get to know each other. Let's get around the table and have a nice lunch with a nice glass of wine and then uh, give everybody the opportunity just to present him or herself and her associations. What do you do? What are your challenges, etc.? And then in the second part of the day, we decided to identify some ideas that we can work on together. And that generated so much energy that we immediately realized that we needed to do this on a regional level. This was just so fantastic. Uh, and so the next step was this. 
Uh, there's a bigger bicycle uh, federation, one of the bicycle federations in our region, it's MDB, that said, well, we are going to organize some um, negotiation uh, sessions in which we're going to try to put all these bicycle associations around one table and to get to agree uh, on, a, on, a, on a charter or on some values, values that we would like to uh, present. So this is one of these meetings. It was very symbolic, it was very powerful because bicycle associations, maybe especially in France, they don't agree on many things. And our challenge was to agree. And we managed to do so. And another powerful instrument that we have as a, as a bicycle association, it is this guide that was made by one of our bicycle associations, it's Paris en Selle. They said, well, let's go to the Netherlands to see how they were able to create a bicycle infrastructure on which everybody can uh, bike safely, even a child that's seven years old, and just write a little book about it. That's what they did. Here it is. It's online. You can download it. It's free. I mean, would be nice to give some money because it's uh, it's it's uh, they 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 made it in their own time, and it shows pictures from France and from the Netherlands. So you can immediately see why things are working in the Netherlands and why they don't work in France. For example, the intersections that I just spoke about. So this is also a big asset of our network. And then this is, I think it's it's my last uh, picture. This is where the RERV started. I was there with a couple of people who said, well, this is the map. Let's start drawing literally with uh, markers to see uh, where, we're, where we're going. And um, so this is just to show you that when citizens like you and me uh, decide to work together and to, to draft an idea that they really think is, is able to, to transform a region, and if they can present it in a professional way with uh, some professional help with some employees possibly because one of our um, federations has employees who could really help us to do the job because we're just um, uh, we're just uh, people who do it in our free time and it just worked out and it's becoming very uh, big yeah this was the last um, uh, this was the last um, picture of my uh, presentation um, how many minutes do i have left Okay, then let me just, um, I think what is important to, to remember from this, it's that it, it's, the, it's really the power of the citizens. Instead of waiting for politicians to have a brilliant idea and start talking uh, to us about it, well, we saw, let's start ourselves and let's just do it, just like the Netherlands, because the current guide, the co-guide, it was actually a version that was made on the basis of what citizen made. So I really have the impression, and maybe it's a nice way to end this presentation to react to what uh, Bruno just said. I think indeed that we're, we're reliving some kind of 70s moment where citizens stick together, where we also have a kind of oil crisis, the yellow vest crisis that we've gone through some time ago. It is basically an oil crisis because the oil, the prices are getting uh, higher and that's why it, it, it got sparked. It's also um, a road security crisis. More and more people, they're sick of the fact that they cannot just uh, use an alternative to the car in a safe way on the street. I mean, that's also what Bruno showed very well with this, this national um, uh, survey that was done that really unveiled that, that people are just sick of it, that people started talking about it, that we're having a global debate, not, not a global, but a national debate about, about safety. And also the... Um, the, the fact that the traffic jams, I mean, the region where I live, I mean, it's always stuck. Whether you have one lane or six lanes, they will always be stuck. So if you really add up all these things, you get to a situation where you can change things on the condition that you're many people, that you're well organized, and that you know what you're talking about. And it's these three things that we put together in the Collective Ville de France to create change. And that change is now happening in, in, the, in the Paris region. Thank you for your attention and over to you, Meredith. So we have a few uh, questions that have, uh, that have come in and maybe we can just sort of throw them out to both of you and, uh, and you can uh, both react. Um, so one was about this, this sort of idea that this is a window of opportunity. And I, this also comes up uh, an interest of mine too, that, um, you know, is this, um, are these sort of um, tactical changes um, a response to only the pandemic or is there, actually a more underlying um, urgency that, um, that is being responded to. 
And then what is the future of the, uh, of the changes? Um, how are politicians and, uh, and organizations, advocacy organizations, citizens group, community groups, how are they supporting um, you know, the, or facilitating the ideas of bringing this to a more permanent uh, situation? So what, what do you guys have any insights into, uh, into this question? Do you want to start, Stein, or should I start? Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, so, so to, thank you, so to answer the, the first question, I can say with almost certainty that uh, we wouldn't have seen this rhythm of change um, so fast without COVID. Uh, absolutely certain. Uh, there were some plans to make things happen, but at this level, um, you know, usually what you've seen in the city of Lyon, just the lines, the yellow lines on the surface, it took them three weeks to agree on how it should be done. And they did it very quickly because it was COVID and it was an emergency. Usually it would take weeks, uh, even more weeks or months for this to happen. So this amount of change took so much effort um, because of the COVID. I'm almost sure that it wouldn't happen that way if uh, it wasn't for the sanitary crisis. So that's the first thing. Um, is it going to be permanent afterwards? Um, I think Stein can answer this, this particular part for Paris, but um, I know in Paris they have created this Rue de Rivoli um, central axis where you have two thirds of the street which is now booked only for uh, bikes and, and, and uh, people using the streets that are not using cars. Uh, and they're looking to make it permanent. Um, City of Paris today announced that if the new mayor if the mayor, current mayor is going to be elected again, she will make a 30 kilometers an hour area all across Paris. So change might happen. Um, COVID usually definitely pushed uh, the, 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 the cycling message. Then it's for us to see the acceptation of the public. We've seen that sometimes change is not linear and also how the politicians are going to react in embracing change. Yeah, just, just to, to add to this, um, I think Paris is not the, the most interesting. The Paris is the most spectacular. Uh, yeah. Paris is the locomotive. It's the, uh, how do you call it? The, it's the, 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 the engine of the train. That, that is why, why, why Paris is, is, is interesting. But uh, it, the biggest revolution is actually happening in the, in the banlieue, in the, in the suburbs. That's where the tensions between the cars and the, and the bicycles will be highest because the pressure of the cars, the pressure of the cars, the car lobby is bigger because you see these four lane highways that are now just two lanes for cars and two lanes for bicycles. And of course, there are much more cars now in waiting in a, in a traffic jam than, than bicycles. So there we have some, some, some struggle and some explanations to give. And that is uh, what we do as citizens. We don't sit and wait for the politicians, but we go out every morning to count the bicycles that pass by. We do bicycle countings, really. We have 40 counting points and we publish the, the data. And what we've proven, it's absolutely unbelievable, is that uh, after the first counting, I, I, um, I made a video. And in that video, I said, because I want to be honest, I said, I saw few bi bikers. But when I counted them, I realized that actually the model share was very high. It was higher than 10%, which is even more than what the region uh, has uh, as an objective. So it's just because, you know, the bicycle lanes, as you know, all, as you all know, it's, it's an optical illusion. Of course, they take so little space that you don't see them. So that, that's one thing uh, with regard to um, the, 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 the future. Yeah, and in Paris, it's going to stay. I mean, I'm, I'm completely convinced of that. Uh, in the suburbs, it's going to be a, a bigger stripe. Actually, as we're speaking, there's a big uh, conference with mayors going on because they're already uh, writing letters because they want to stop it. So that's going to be, um, uh, that's going to be something. And last remark, why was this corona crisis such a, a big game changer? It's because of the governance. It's not very sexy, but that's why it changed. Because before, when you made a bicycle lane, you had to go all the way from the citizen to the mayor, to the, uh, to the département, the province, to the préfet, to the minister, etc. And that you know, takes uh, months, years, and then you had to start dra drafting it, etc. Now, all the people are sitting around one table with one goal that they have in common, namely, we need bicycle infrastructure now. So instead of waiting 20 years, we just started with uh, just a, a scrap bike, uh, bike lane, a pop-up bike lane, and we adjust it as we go. And that is why it worked out. Great, thank you. We have a more operational 
question, uh, one about uh, how the, the bike lanes actually emerge. So is it from um, is it from parking space that's been now restricted? And what happened from uh, how, how did that you know, operationally occur? Um, and um, any other emphasis on sort of this idea of, of park and ride or park and pedal for those who are driving from rural areas into towns and, and cities? Do one of you have, a, have an insight into the operations? So uh, in the city of Lyon where I'm living, what I can see is that most of the configuration that has been done is really painting on um, the road. And it's not about reconfiguring parking spots um, or I'm not aware of them yet. But um, parking is a very sensitive political issue still in France, particularly in uh, big cities. And um, I'm not sure the politicians were looking to go on this particular fight on top of what was already out. So the idea was really to go quick uh, as Stein mentioned, really uh, use the pop-up bike lane, temporary method, agile method, and, and do it what was there. Um, when it comes to park and ride, um, I know there are still you know, thoughts in, in there, um, but it's difficult because some of them are not being used, and a few of them are very saturated. You come at, the, at 7 a.m. in the morning, they are already full. So it's, it's, it's still an ongoing process when it comes to park and ride. But uh, for sure, it's going to be one of the um, you know, next uh, plans, the next challenge in the future for cities. Yeah, what, what I can just add is that in, in, in the Paris region, it's mostly done on, on big avenues that are, that are alongside uh, public transportation lines. Because the, the rationale behind it is that you unburden public transportation. So you look for big avenues, national or uh, the provincial highways, to just take up two uh, lanes out of four or more. So it's rather easy to do. Sometimes if it's a smaller road, you just make it a one-way road, but that's already politically very sensitive. And in Paris, they have the power to do it because 60% of the Paris uh, families don't have a car, but in the suburbs, it's quite difficult. Yeah, so speaking of these smaller communities, we also had another question of what, uh, if you, if maybe it was to Bruno, if you can give more detail about the kinds of support and assistance needed for these smaller French cities and suburbs. Um, yes, um, I, I believe what you've seen about the city of, of Nice can be transposed in some city as well. Um, usually the way it was done, the pop-up bike lanes was very top to bottom meaning there was an emergency, we had to find a solution. So politician decided and they put the technical team on and it was done. Um, for smaller cities, you have to, as Stein mentioned, to build a consensus. Uh, it's important that you put all the people around the table, a representative for retailers, representative for uh, cultural association, social association, and, and make them speak, um, particularly when it comes to matters such as um, how do kids go to school by bike? Well, you have to make sure you have the school around the table, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an ongoing process and needs to be uh, done at a very uh, local level with everyone around the table. If you do it too quickly, as we've seen with the city of Nice, you are facing potential backlash and you have people who are going to go after the, the, the pop-up bike line. Um, you know, some, some people were going uh, saying that um, we're not building this for only two or three cyclists, or they are not being used, or they take too much space. Um, if you don't put these people at the beginning of the reflection of the discussion, they are going to be de facto opponents of your projects. So I would suggest um, working in teams uh, with each representative in smaller cities. Uh, the good thing is in smaller cities, things tend to happen quickly because the layers that Stein described is smaller. So you can have quicker decisions. And what you can add when you're talking about smaller cities that just even smaller cities, they are parts of a bigger puzzle. So what, what you need to, 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 to show them is that they're, they're part of this bigger, uh, this bigger infrastructure. I mean, I, I grew up in a super small village. It's still super small, 1300 inhabitants. And I had to go to school five kilometers away. So if I had a bicycle association in my little village, I could have never done anything. I mean, basically speaking. 
Uh, but when you can show that you can connect these cities and have all the children go to the school in the other city on a bike, that completely changes the, the situation. Because five kilometers, it's just the distance that you can easily do by bike. And I, I think that that is the challenge to see. And the governance in France is not made that way. But because uh, a mayor is only the boss of his or her own uh, streets. So it's not very interesting for that person to think about streets outside the city. And that's where the citizen power comes in. That's where the citizens have to say, hey, okay, I live in Fontenay-Rose, but I work in La Ile Rose. So please make a bicycle lane in between us. And for that, you need the, the citizens to put really literally the mayors around one table and to get them to talk together about bicycle lanes. It's already quite something for mayors to have a meeting at the same time because they're important people, etc. And then also talk about a, a strange topic like bikes. You know, For that, you need a lot of uh, noise and uh, that is what we what we made in a very professional and, and serene way, uh, I have to say. What's interesting to see after this COVID crisis is that even before, mayors used to, five years ago, laugh at you a little bit when you were talking about bike policy. Now they listen and they almost put it in their program for the municipal election or they, they, they put it as a centerpiece of their program. So mentalities are changing slowly. Uh, but they are changing, and it's very encouraging when you see the states um, of what it was uh, about five years from now. Great, yeah, and maybe um, on that note of, of governance and, and orgware, um, are there any, is there any insights about how the, um, how the tactical approaches have been delivered in, in terms of, you know, how they're um, making the changes on the ground? Are they using, um, you know, volunteers? Is it just based on, uh, you know, staff capacity? Uh, I mean, staff resources already really tight for a lot of municipal cities. Um, so how are they, you know, how are they mobilizing? Um, um, how are they mobilizing their, their, their own staff and, and community? Do you want to reply, Stein, or? Yeah, even that is that is fluid. We see, for example, that the, the, the provinces who are uh, uh, competent for the, the province roads, the departemental, uh, they can't uh, they can't do it all because it's too much work. So they agreed with other layers. It's a bit complicated in the Paris region to to help each other out, which would be unimaginable just uh, just some some time ago. But as these other this other administrative administrative layer also has to find some political uh, um, interest uh, because other elections are coming up they're interested in doing so because these mayor they want to show up they want to show that they're capable of, of looking at the future and have a real vision in favor of the bike to answer your question Meredith uh, most of the configuration you've seen were taken care of by the municipalities um, although we see some um, actions, pop-up actions uh, in Paris, for example, beginning of this week, um, Stein might confirm that with me, they have located small panels uh, because you had the lanes, but you didn't have any signals to show the pop-up bike lane. So they have put this 330 signals across Paris on the main lines that are following the metro lines, just as Stein was saying. And now you have a color code and you follow the line all the way through which is very comfortable when it comes to bike riding. And that, that's a pure citizens, a citizen initiative. It was done by, by Paris en Celle because what I just showed you, it's the RERV. It is the, um, the, the, the big regional uh, bicycle network. But in Paris, you have the metro. Everybody knows the metro. That comes from the word metropolitan. And this bicycle association drew a Velopolitan, the bike metro, which is the same thing. It's also a network, but on the surface with bicycle lanes. So they, again, they did the same trick that we did with this regional bicycle network. They made a copy of the, uh, of the, the metro network with the same colors, and they just um, drew the lines on the streets. And now actually, just as you said, they also put up these, uh, these signs. And it's, it's something that, you know, we are completely in this bubble. We know that it exists. We, we see this map all the time. But the people who you want to reach, they have no idea that it exists. So you need to use all the power you have to get the message out there. And that means that you need to go literally in front of the eyes of people to say, here, that's where you are. That's where you can go with the destination, with the color, with the, with the arrow. 
And that is how you slowly, slowly get people to, to use this infrastructure by making it visible. It's, it's so obvious, but still it's super important. We had a few more, a few people join. I think maybe some times got mixed up, but just a reminder that this is going to be, this whole meeting has been uh, recorded and it will be up on the Urban Cycling Institute YouTube uh, YouTube channel. So for those who have, have missed some of the conversation, uh, you can join there. We have uh, maybe one more minute. I have to go pick up my children, but uh, in, a, in a few minutes, but um, I have made Stein and Bruno uh, co-hosts. So um, you guys can all continue the conversation together in a, in a more informal atmosphere. But maybe one last question that's, uh, that's come in um, is that, you know, we do know a lot uh, of research has come out on the benefits, the economic benefits of cycling. Um, but maybe there has been some new, you know, new exciting evidence on uh, on these tactical measures um, and you know the economic benefits for neighbor neighborhood communities. Um, do you know of any reports that have come out recently showing this type of data that could then benefit others who are trying to convince uh, decision makers? Um, I am aware of a report, 2003 reports. That's kind of a long time ago. That was showing um, um, 10 to 15 percent increase um, in terms of uh, monthly expenses for people coming by bike as compared to people coming by car. That was in 2003. Uh, now I know that um, um, someone from the Ec Ecology Authority, uh, Mathieu Chassigny in France, is leading some works in that particular case. So he's talking cycling and walking. Um, what does that do to businesses? Um, but I can refer to uh, this study to uh, people who are interested. I don't have the number in my head, to be honest. Yeah, I love this question because, of course, it's all about the money. But the funny thing is that, strangely, when you talk about money in, in, in a bicycle uh, situation, people don't listen. Because actually, there is a report. I just tried to look it up on my, uh, on my Twitter account because I tweeted it that calculated officially that I think that the spin-off of, of a bicycle infrastructure was something like you save, you know, 20 million, 20 billion uh, euros or something. I mean, it's a huge amount. It's just completely crazy, you know? And so I would say, so I think I tweeted it saying something like, well, this is the report. As of this report, you know, we should just start building urgently bicycle infrastructure. But it doesn't even become the, the, the topic of a conversation, strangely. It's because I think that the real barriers, they're in, the, in our heads. They're in our heads that, in France, I'm, I'm, I'm talking, of course, that the bicycle, it's, it's, it's leisure, it's sport, it's complicated, it's, uh, you do it when you're a poor person, you see, the cultural image that you have, you do that when you have a problem, you know, it's, it, there's so many things against biking that you can tell whatever you want, you can tell that you get money for free, even then people will not start biking. People will start biking, when you create the bicycle infrastructure, just as was done in Paris, and you see more and more people hopping on the bikes. And that is what is happening now. And I think that will be much more powerful than, you know, the many numbers we have. We know that um, the traffic jams in Paris, they, 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 they cost something like 22 billion um, euros uh, per year because people are doing nothing in traffic jams. We know that uh, road insecurity costs 50 billion euros every year. Uh, because of you know all the accidents etc uh, and uh, the the fact of sitting all day on the chair and not moving also costs 17 billion euros every year uh, but these numbers they i mean we use them but the the, the best advocate of, of a bicycle is the bicycle itself 